Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Aaron Newcomb joins me. We're going to be talking about Serenity for Android. It's a Plex client that lets you play media on your Android devices like your Google TV. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Aaron Newcomb. Episode 256, recorded June 26, 2013. Serenity for Android. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, MerlinAtStoneAge.com, bringing you almost each week, I'm sorry, almost each week, we had to cancel last week's show, that's a long story, um, uh, the movers, the shakers, the big projects, small projects, projects you haven't heard of, projects you might be using every day and not knowing it. That's a wonderful show, I enjoy doing it, bringing it to you as often as I can. Each week I'm also joined by a co-host this week, it's none other than Aaron Newcomb. Aaron, welcome back to the show. Hey, Randall, good to be here. Hey, good. Hey, and your audio is working. We had some pre-show difficulties with that, but you are able to Yay. talk. That's important. That's important. <laughs> and for those of you who have uh, seen this show on video many, many times, you may also notice that uh, I am not speaking into my big blue Yeti. It is uh, currently 150 miles away in the trunk of my car. My car is being loaned to a friend of mine for about a month while I travel all over the world. More about that at the end of the show. But uh, for now, let's just talk for a second about today's guest. We have David Carver who's going to come along. And he's going to talk to us about Serenity for Android. Now, I have to admit, I'm looking at the description of this, and it says it's a Plex media server client. And I don't exactly know what... Plex media server client means is that is it have to talk to a Plex media server and show things? Do you understand this, Aaron? I don't really get it from the description yet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Plex uh, is a uh, is a media server that you would run in, in your house or whatever to stream all your media out to devices. Um, it's similar to what you can do with XBMC or or lots of other things, um, but this one is is kind of. Um, uh, well, it's it's a little bit more commercialized in that you have to, usually have to pay for the clients, um, but uh, it w does work really well, and uh, so that's what this thing does. So this is the client end of that, and this will uh, well we'll find out from the guests, but this will probably sit on one of your devices uh, connected to your TV or something and let you watch movies from your living room. Okay, so I, I I have Plex on my Mac laptop, so I can play media that's actually on the laptop this way, but you're talking about something that's a server-client relationship where I might have like a network-attached storage or something device that yeah, has media exactly. on it. Yeah, exactly. And then the Plex... So you got... Plex Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that's exactly right. So the the this is operating as a server, and then you have a client piece that connects to it and streams that media over to the client. And so what's the what's the Android component to this? Is because it's written for Android, and that's why it can run on some tablets and on Google TV devices? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, Android is uh, very good at, at these client pieces. So I run XBMC, for example, on my phone and on my tablet um, to stream from my XBMC server um, in a very similar fashion. So this will be very interesting to see how this compares to them. Okay, great, great. Well, I'm glad you were here to explain this to me because I, I kept reading that. I kept, well, I saw the words server and client right next to each other. It just it confused me. I didn't understand what the point was for that, but I'm glad you're here to describe it. But I know somebody who can describe this even better than the two of us can. So let's go ahead and bring him onto the call. So welcome to the show, uh, David. Uh, what's your name? Ah, it was behind this other thing. It's, oh, it's right there on the screen. David Carver, welcome to the show. <laughs> welcome. Hey, guys. Hey, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a little spacey today because I, I was reading the website and then I went, well, where's my notes about who's going to be on the show? That's no good. Uh, and where are you speaking to us from? I'm from um, Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio. I have been there a few times. There's the Columbus Linux Fest, I think, uh, every year. And I went there, uh, I think, two or three years ago. Ohio Linux Fest, yeah. that's what it's called. O Ohio Linux yeah. Fest. I, I used to live in, I lived in Cincinnati for 20 years, so it's good to have a fellow Ohioan on the show today. <laughs> yep. Very cool. So you, so you heard... Our stumbled description of what this thing is actually doing, Serenity. Uh, why don't you give us sort of the 30,000 foot view and tell us about the problem that it solves? Yeah, um, Serenity, Serenity is a uh, client for the Plex Media Server. So you have a Plex Media Server. Um, it can be running on Windows, Linux, Mac, um, or any of the, uh, even the network uh, NAS drives um, to go through and support Plex as, as a server 
portion. Serenity is actually a client that uh, connects to the Plex Media server and lets you stream um, your videos, music, and um, TV shows um, to your um, Google TV device or a um, Android tablet. And I just actually just recently tested this last night. It will also work on a, an OUYA um, as well. Okay, so um, Android tablets, uh, that would be like the, the Galaxy and a bunch of other things like that? Yeah, the, the one I tested it mainly on is Nexus 7, but it um, works on any um, t tablet that has at least a 600 DPI width um, at portion to it. So it, it can even work on some of the um, of the tablets, um, like the Galaxy Note and Galaxy Note 2 um, can also go through and run this as well. Cool. And so I would use this if I have a lot of media and I have maybe uh, a device attached to my, my – uh, my big screen TV, or maybe I'm sitting there with a, you know, a big uh, tablet, uh, you know, in bed, you know, watching, watching videos. What, and is this actually Plex, but adapted, or is this something that looks like Plex? It's, uh, well, the way it came about was that the Plex has an official app for Google TV. And when I originally bought a Vizio CoStar uh, last August, um, put the Plex app on there. Uh, while it worked, um, the, the app itself was really a tablet app. It wasn't really done optimized for um, viewing on a TV um, type experience. So the way Serenity came around was that I wanted a better experience for viewing on the Google TV. So I decided to write my own app um, that would go through and um, work the way that I, that I thought it should go, go through and work on. Um, and that plus, I also wanted to learn Android at the time, so it's a good uh, opportunity for me to go through and scratch scratch a niche I had. Um, what I found as I was going through and developing it, that the same interface I had developed for it worked actually quite well on tablets as well. So that's kind of how it's evolved out to from it's a, starting as a Google TV project out into a um, app that can run also on the, on the tablets and um, also on the Ouya devices as well. So so. Okay, so there that opens up a couple of interesting things. So the first one is Google TV. I mean, Google TV as a development choice is really interesting. It obviously fits really well for the type of uh, application you're designing here, but um, it, it's it, it doesn't have a lot of uptake. I mean, I'm really glad to see you developing for Google TV because Google TV needs more apps that run on it right now um, in order to con have it continue to be a viable platform, I think. Um, was was that your did, was that your first inclination, and how did that work out? Were you were you a little bit afraid to develop for Google TV initially, or did you did you ever think about developing for the smaller devices, or were you just like, nah, they're just too small, it's not going to look good? Yeah, it, uh, it mainly was because uh, I had an itch. Um, and Google TV was my was was what I was using the um, to view a lot of my media on. So and I was tired of the um, interface that wasn't optimized for the Google TV. Plus, I was getting tired of hearing people say that there were no good Google TV um, applications out there. So it was a combination of things for me to go through and do. The, the fact that I had the itch that the people were complaining that there was no good Google TV um, applications out there, and they um. To go through, go through and do this. Plus, I took the open source route just because I wanted to say, okay, here, here's an example. Here's how you can go through and write a Google TV app. This is the way you can go through and do it. And hopefully, it will help educate other people on how to go through and optimize their apps for a Google TV type device. Right. Right. No, that's great. I know there's a lot of other. Well, I say a lot. There's a, at least a handful of other Plex clients out there available on a Google Play store. So, um, I mean, what was it about those other clients? I think there's one from Plex, for example, that you can you can buy for two ninety nine or something like that, or maybe it's four ninety nine actually. Um, uh, yeah. What I was to say was to say there is the uh, the reason I went through and and um, developed it was that the all those some. Um, Clients, um, the, the official Plex client. I know they're they're working on. They've got a new version that's out that's much better on Google TV. Um, but the original one for Google TV um, had a lot of crash problems. Um, you would try to launch it, you could play it back, and then it would crash. Um, but it was always a tablet optimized interface. It wasn't um, something that was designed to take um, on. A, on a TV, when you design it for a TV, you want it to be very visual. Um, the fonts have to be very large because people are going to be sitting back 10 feet from the um, TV, so they need to be able to go through and see it from a distance. Um, you have a basically a um, remote control 
to go through and use and navigate. You don't have a touch screen device, so you got to optimize for um, use of the remote control and be able to navigate around it. Uh, and layouts just weren't optimized for the uh, Google TV environment. So the Serenity itself takes a lot of them. It's look and feel from some of the XBMC skins um, out there, but it also takes influences from a lot of the old older home theater um, server applications like Windows Media Center, GB PVR, and several other um, stuff that came out um, before X XBMC was even um, very popular. So now, are you a big? I take it you're a big Plex user. Why why Plex instead of XBMC? Um, basically because of my experience with XBMC in the past was that, um, you need a pretty good, um, powerful device to go through and run it. Um, uh, I've, I've got a low end, um, home theater PC that I've, um, go through and store most of my stuff on and it access my Plex media server. And when I've tried to run XBMC in, on that in the past, it, um, would have, um, um, performance problems just in the way of the UI. So that's kind of what led me to Plex um, to begin with. Then the uh, client can be offloaded to a device that's more dedicated to working as the, as the client platform. Um, besides, I, I like the um, the way that um, Plex access the central um, storage um, location and then I can just have multiple clients um, go through and connect to it and pick up um, right from one or if you start, stop up one place, you can go through and pick up another device, pick it up, and just start picking it up where, where you left off on, on another device. So it has that Netflix-type um, functionality to it as well. Yeah. Now, uh, what were the challenges that you faced when you were developing this for um, – you said that you were kind of new to Android, so I'm, so I'm kind of curious what your experience was like. I mean, how long did it take you to get the app written and, and up to a functional state? How long have you been working on it? Well, uh, it started back in um, December um, of last year. Um, started uh, working on it over Christmas break. Um, it, the main functionality to get the the, the streaming um, aspect of it into, into place took probably about a month or so. Uh, the biggest challenges, though, were um, not necessarily with Android itself. Um, there are, were some challenges just from not having done Android development before that I had to go through and learn, like making sure you don't put stuff on the UI thread and block that, um, make liberal use of um, services, um, make sure everything's async and stuff like that so you don't um, block the UI thread. But the biggest challenge has really been um, piecing together the, AP the REST API that you needed to go through and talk to with, um, with Plex. Uh, there's bits and pieces of the information out there on their forms, um, but a lot of it is you just have to go through and do some trial and error to figure this stuff out. And the one piece that they do have out there that does give us some pretty good examples are their um, Roku client that they've gone through in open source. Um, so I've used that a lot to go through and figure out what the API calls should be um, to get to some of the information like updating the um, progress information when you're playing back playing back a movie right right so that's so, again another uh, good use of open source is the ability to go look and see what someone else has done and then come back and and uh, uh, make it work on your own project which is great um, so but we should also say I mean you're no you, you so you've got Java experience before I know in your bio you I think you said you've you've been working on um, uh, Eclipse so you're you you've been doing Eclipse web tools uh, you've been a committer for five years um, I mean, all kinds of different projects that you've worked on. So you've got some, you've got some pretty good Java experience coming to Android um, development, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, the Android, the, the Java portion wasn't the um, problem picking up. It's just uh, as if with any new API, it's just learning what the framework um, provides, how you have to go through and interact with that framework, and um, just uh, just going through and. Um, Experimenting with the with the stuff to figure out what's going to work well, what what doesn't work well. Um, I did a lot of research on Stack Overflow um, to find answers to a lot of questions I had. Um, the Google TV developers themselves um, actually hang out on Stack Overflow as well, um, so they are pretty good good at answering questions when you run into some oddball situations that are particular to the particular devices that you run to using with the um, with the Google TV. Um, but yeah, the Android community itself is there's a lot of uh, good helpful information out there and there's a lot of good open source projects um, that I do go through and leverage within um, Serenity as well 
um, to go through and then provide a lot of the functionality um, within it. Within it. Right, right. So walk us through real quick what it looks like um, from a, a setup standpoint. I've got this running actually um, on on my Nexus Seven, but I don't have a Plex server. Uh, I can show you the uh, what the yeah, setting screen well, looks like. Very nice. Uh, yeah. You know that, but that's as yeah. far as I can get because I don't have a Plex server. So after I yeah. hit settings, how easy is this to set up? Uh, well, after you hit settings, it's um, actually fairly fairly easy. It does go through and use DLNL. DLNA, which on Plex um, does go through and um, supports for discovery of the server. So um, it will go through and use that. Um, what you'll get is a, when you hit settings, you'll get a, um, a list of um, options. You'll get one of the options is called discovered um, Plex uh, media servers. And it will, uh, if, you, if you hit that, it will go through and give you a list of um, the Plex media servers that, you, that it found. You can select one of them to go through and use, and that'll be your default media server. Um, if it doesn't have um, discovered as a uh, enabled option, you have what's known as the preferred servers um, option, and then you can within that you can actually go in and enter in the IP address of the Implex media server, and that will then um, connect you up to the um, media server. If you hit back, then you'll get a um, listing of the um, categories and, and options that you have within it so like you have movies you may have tv shows and yeah i guess recently started working on adding um music library um support um there are some screenshots out there on the um google play store um that give um, a good example of what some of the screenshots would look like after you um get the initial setup um done Cool. Maybe, maybe I don't know, John, set up for this. Maybe you can go to the Play Store and bring some of those up while we're talking. So do you have support for um, – uh, so, so you mentioned there was like movies, TV shows. And since I'm not a Plex user, are those defined on the server side? Do you put those in certain directories or are those defined on the client side? Those, those are defined on the, uh, on the server side. There's a, Plex has a, a web application that you can go through and use to set up. In fact, that's what I recommend people go through and use to manage the Plex media server. Um, I'm not, don't really have, to, um, don't really have a, a time right now or plans right now to go through and actually support directly managing the Plex media server through the um, Serenity application itself. Uh, the web application that Plex has does a very good job of um, doing that, so kind of let people go off and use that. But once you've got your media directories and stuff set up within the Plex media server itself, um, it, it goes through and scans it, does the um, download into the metadata, and um, goes through and populates all that stuff into its um, database. And then once the client can then go through and connect up, and it will go through and display that information that Plex has gone through and uh, collected. It also goes through and provides a link back to for the client to go through and be able to direct play the files. One thing I should note is that Serenity does not go through and support the trans um, um, transcoding ability of, of Plex. Uh, the main reason for that is there are some licensing um, restrictions that Plex um, has put in place. Um, if you're going to go through and do any commercial um, retail selling of the of your application, um, they require a um, license, a percentage of of the app sales um, in order to go through and uh, allow you to go through and do um, transcoding um, for the for the key that you need. If you go through and um, just uh, Give it away, then you can use their um, free open open key um, for the transcoding. But um, if you do commercial stuff, you have to go through and um, license out the key. So is that because you are selling this on the Play Store for two dollars? I mean, what if you were to give it away for free? Would you be able to uh, take advantage yeah, of that? Yeah, if I yeah, because I'm selling it on Play Store for two dollars. Uh, the main reason for that is just to try to recoup some development costs. Um, if people don't want to go through and pay for it, they can download the um, development versions for free um, directly from the site, or they can download the code and build it build it themselves. Um, and the, the portions of those funds will also go to the CHA um, Animal Shelter here in um, Columbus, Ohio at the end of the year here. Um, but yeah, if I didn't, didn't go through and um, sell it on the Play Store, then yeah, I could go through and use the, the, the free key and go through and um, um, add the and transcoding um, capability um, to the application. Hmm, that's really interesting. Did you go back and forth about whether to charge or not, or did you ever think about just doing an ad-supported model instead? 
Yeah, I've um, gone back and forth on it. Um, I guess figure, yeah, I've, I've done. I haven't done, gone, gone through and really looked at the ad supported model. The fact um, that I'm looking at going through and doing the Ouya is um, where I may go through and do um, an ad supported um, um, model for for that. But in general, I guess wanted to be able to get maybe some um, development costs back because um, it's open source, but it's free and some beer. Um, so, I mean, there's some, there's always some sort of cost somewhere that somebody has to go through and absorb. And I figured uh, two bucks is a small convenience fee um, for, so, to be able to get you know, update notifications and management through the, um, through the Google Play Store to, for the, for the end user. If somebody, again, if somebody really can't afford the $2, they can go to the, um, developers website and download um, development versions from it those will always be free um, I don't go through and ever want to go through and charge somebody to go through and t beta test um, software for me right right well that's really good for sure uh, it's nice that you do offer the the development version um, let's talk a little bit more about the the guts of the system so do you did you write your own media player to handle this or are you using a different media player in the background well, it depends on the internal. There's an internal bound player in, in there, um, and it's actually since Google TV doesn't support an NDK, I'm um, just using all the um, standard Android APIs for the built-in Android um, media player um, to go through and support the playback um, on the local network. Um, for those devices that don't have the extra codecs that like a lot of the uh, like the Nexus 7, um, I do go through and support external um, media players. So you can use something like MX Player or VLC or any of the numerous other um, external um, third-party media players that are out there. Um, one of the goals with this application was to go through and play well with um, other um, third-party applications. Um, I didn't want to necessarily have to go through and be the, the best in um, in terms best video player, the best music player, um, if somebody had a preference um, for one that they really like to go through and use, I wanted to be able to give them an option to go through and use that um, to go through and play back their, their video content. So that's really interesting. So how does that work? If I, uh, let's say I've got my Nexus 7 here, let's let's pretend I, I was able to get it set up because I've got a Plex server running and then I go to play my, my uh, a movie, right? I browse to it and I, I click on it. Will it automatically open? Will it ask me at that point since it's on a Nexus 7? Will it ask me, do you want to play this in, uh, you know, MX player or the native, I uh, forget what Android calls it when it pops up on the screen, like video player, I think, or something. Yeah. Well, um, does, does it ask you or does it just does it just pick one by default and then and then bring well, that up? For, for the Nexus 7, um, for the Nexus 7, it, since it's not running on a Google TV device and it knows it doesn't ha necessarily have all the codecs, uh, there's an option that we um, – have in the settings for say uh, prefer external um, player. If you click that, it will automatically go through and basically start a um, intent and go through and pass in the um, video URL and any uh, application that can go through and support the video um, MIME type will go through and um, be an option to go through and have it play back. You can then go through, it'll give you a list of the um, um, players that you have on there and then standard um, uh, Android intent uh, selection, you can go through and select to have one as the default, and then it'll continue launching that one um, from that point forward. Uh, if you turn off the um, preference in the in the settings, it will go through and always try to um, use the internal um, video player. Oh, interesting. So you can you can say uh, you can control that from the settings. You can go in and say um, basically use the default or use the one that I choose, and then if I choose that one, it'll play that. It'll use that every time. Yeah, that's that's basically um, basically the way it works. The um, there's a little bit different. There's the external player option tells it to um, whether to go through and use the third party client. If you turn that off, it will you always try to use its internal player, um, which gives you some different um, overlays and then some more information when you hit the. Um, when you tap the screen, it'll give you some more information on the movie that's playing and that stuff like that. But if you turn on the external on um, player option, first, if you first time you launch it, it will come up and pop up that box that says, okay, which player do you want to go through and use? Um, if you go through and use the standard Android, select select another player, then select select you always use as default. Um, then it will always next time you go through and launch it, it always use that um, application you had just selected as the um, player to play back the videos and stuff. 
So if you turn on, if you go back, clear your settings in the in your app settings and clear the default um, launch launch selections, uh, then you then it'll go back and reprompt you back 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 up with that um, that selection dialog again. So I have to admit, this all sounds sort of foreign to me since I don't have anything that runs Android and I don't have a Google TV and I, I sort of dislike Java. So uh, it's, this is all like out of my areas. I really appreciate the fact that Aaron's been able to ask such wonderful questions so far. But I actually had a couple questions listening to this so far. Um, does this um, does does this client uh, where it's running, I know you're saying it's talking to a Plex server, but can it also talk to a live stream? Can it? You know, given a URL or something, can it can it uh, suck down a live stream from from a broadcast site? Yeah, actually, the way it's, way the player is set up, I mean, it's just a standard um, using the standard Android API and a media player that's built into um, Android's uh, API. So all you had, if you get, have a live stream, in fact, one of the things I'm planning on adding um, support for, I just haven't had a um, chance to do it yet. It's on my to do list is to add um, video and netcast and podcasts. Um, support to the um, application itself. Um, Plex has what's known as channels, um, which goes through and it acts a lot like the, um, those live streams and stuff like that to be able to go through and um, play those. Um, Serenity can go through and support those. I just haven't gone through and put all the um, ties in place um, to go through and, and do that. So if you have a live um, stream URL, um, yeah, Serenity could go through and, um, and play that because all it's doing is just passing in the URL to the existing um, Android media player. Does that mean you could have like tight integration with, say, something like a, a YouTube uh, Hangout on Air uh, live stream, or is that like night and day? Is there no, no way to get? Yeah, actually, the, YouTube for play? for the YouTube, yeah, for the YouTube stuff, you probably have to go through and use the um, the YouTube API. Um, again, it's another thing I'm considering going through and doing um, for the for Serenity is to allow you playment of the um, of the YouTube. But the thing is with the uh, way Serenity works also, if you have the YouTube URL, um, you could technically go through and just launch an intent and then it will go through and launch the existing YouTube player you have on your device um, to go back and um, play back that, that video. So you don't necessarily have to go through and have Serenity do all this stuff. The beauty of Android is that you can go through and set up these intents and then if you want to pass them off to another application to go through and handle on the playback of the of the video. You know, I, I bet Aaron knows what this word means, but I'm completely baffled every time you said the word intent. What is that? Intent is a is a, an API that lets you go through and launch another application. So um, there's uh, certain applications that will go through and listen for commands or intents to say, "Hey, I can go through and play this." Um, if there's a intent that is launched. The application will go through and say, "Okay, yeah, I can understand this. I can I can provide services around this to help play that play that back." So it's just a way to go through and interface with um, other applications that are that may be running on your on your device. Okay, so it's a terminology specifically from the Android community because, like I said, I've never I haven't heard that before that direction before. So uh, good, now yeah. I got that cleared up, and I, I bet there's about 47 people listening to this that all said, "Oh my God, I'm glad he asked that question." <laughs> I was like, "What does he mean? What does he mean?" All right, good, we got that. Um, uh, let's back up a little bit. So, if I if I heard correctly, you only started this like like six months ago, right? Yeah, I only started about six months. I first started it um, around around Christmas time in um, in December. Okay, and has it just been a one-man show so far, or have you had code contributions from others? No, uh, it's actually been a one-man show so far, and it's one of the reasons I was interested in getting um, the word out about this is that if anybody is actually interested in working on this or has an itch or just wants to learn Android development or just for whatever reason wants to add some functionality and features to it, um, I'm more than willing to take code contributions. The code's out there on GitHub. Um, so it's nice. It's easy for people to go through and fork it. Um, I like to try to get this running on more than just the um, the tablets and the and the Google TV and the larger screen devices. I like to try to get this eventually running down the smaller um, screens. But I only have so much time um, to go through and work on it, and I only have so many um, hours in the day. So uh, it'd be great to get this um, a larger community um, starting to form around this and to um, See where, see which direction it goes over the next um, year or so. And what's it like testing this thing? Do you have unit tests for your code, or do you have like some sort of end-to-end -end tests when it all gets assembled to see if it's actually going to play a video, or is that all manual right now? 
Uh, it's partially manual, and uh, there are um, some. There's unit tests definitely around the the API for the um, for the REST client and stuff. There are some using um, the. I think try and remember which framework I use right now. That is Robo. Um, shoot. Eric probably would remember off the top of his head, but yeah, there is a UI unit testing framework I have in place um, as well for some of the code, but the UI aspect isn't um, tested as much that way. So a lot of it is just me going through and using it um, development versions on my own device. So I dog food a lot of the um, the code that I go through and and um, and work on before I go through and release it out to um, the Google Play Store. Cool. And I'm going to be a programmer for a second. I'm saying so what. What's the layout like on Android in terms of adapting to different size devices? Are you is it sort of like a grid model and it automatically expands to fill the space or changes the font size to fill the space or what what sort of control do you have over the look and feel of something that has to be on different size devices? Yeah, there's actually lay Android has a lot of stuff that you can go through and do. You can set out um, different layouts, um, which are basically just XML files, and we go through and use. Um, Relative layouts within the um, within the XML files, so I don't go through and do exact positioning. Um, so it's depending on the DPI width and stuff, it will go through and expand out. But you can also go through and control it, so you can set up different resource layout files for different um, device screen sizes. Um, right now, I only have it set up for um, devices that are uh, using a high density HDPI um, display setting. Um, but there, this is where the work where I can help have benefit and help from the community would be going through and coming up with the layout sizes for the uh, smaller devices because uh, a lot of, there's some information that we would need to go through and take out. There's some information and rearrangement of where the way information is displayed on the screen that we would need to go through and change as well. So, so is, Android has to, has quite a bit of um, configurability around that that aspect. So this is similar to what somebody has to do if they're going to make a responsive website that also talks to like a like an iPhone or something compared to like a, a full web screen, right? Correct. Yeah. Cool. Um, and is there a way to simulate that? I mean, can you actually say, uh, you know, run it in some sort of emulator that says pretend I have this grid size, or uh, do you just really have to run it on the real devices to be able to to uh, test that? Well, the, there's the Google TV developers just always recommend go through and test on the Google TV device. Um, actually, the Android does have um, an emulator um, in there, so you can go through and set up the different device um, densities and configurations and screen sizes and stuff like that. So you can go through and launch the application within the emulator emulator as well. Um, but again, depending on your um, application, you may um, – Notice some performance um, slowness from the from the emulator compared to actually what you get running on an actual device itself. I've actually found um, that for best performance in the emulator, if you use the Intel X86 um, image for the for Android within the emulator, you actually get better uh, more better performance on your um, computer than you do on the actual device at times. So you have to be you have to test on both both of them. Um, at the same time, it's because you're going to get some idios idiosyncrasies between what the emulator shows and what the um, devices may, may go through and show as well. Yeah, I found that as well. I mean, it can vary quite a bit. I mean, I've, I've only done a little bit of Android development, but it, definitely there's a big gap. I mean, it works great for a proof of concept if you're running the emulator, um, but you really have to have devices to test off of to get um, to make sure everything is working. I'm just curious, have you used, I, I'm sure since you've, um, been involved in Eclipse for, for quite a while that you're probably using Eclipse to do your development. But have you tried Android Studio? I know that they've got some pretty cool uh, layout previews that you can do. And I don't know if they have layout previews for Google TV necessarily, or uh, I'm sure they do for Nexus 7, though. Have you tried Android Studio at all? No, I haven't had um, tried Android Studio. The, my problem usually with IntelliJ is that I can't get by the um, the user interface and the old um, Swing um, interface to it so um but i do plan on try to try to go through and um um test it out especially if that's if that's the direction that the android developers are going to go themselves then i'll probably go through and um, start taking a look at it but they've gone through and said that they're still planning to support the eclipse and the eclipse plugin so um but yeah i mean it's good choice it's good that the there's android studio out there because i know there's a lot of intellij um fans out there 
Yeah, it seems like they're really working. Um, I, I, I'm glad they're supporting Eclipse. I mean, I think people would feel alienated if they didn't. Um, but it seems like there's there's a lot of work going on right now with, and I don't know why. It would be interesting to find out. Maybe we'll cover that on All About Android sometime. But um, you know, it seems like they're they're putting a lot of effort into IntelliJ into Android Studio, which is based off of IntelliJ. We should say, uh, just to clarify. Um, uh, I just saw some new some new things that they released this week, in fact, and so it seems like they're they're going down that route in terms of developing new features and things. So, um, yeah, that's that's really interesting to to hear what your one, perspective is, given yeah. given that you've done so much with Eclipse. Yeah, from what, from what I've heard from within the Eclipse stuff is that um, the the guy, developers at Android um, Studio there were concerned about not being able to get some of the changes that they needed to have into the, the Eclipse um, platform, uh, particularly around the JDT and the way it goes through and handles um, batch um, compilations and how the how they would need to go through and integrate with um, their Gradle build system into the Eclipse platform um, to be able to go through and get a good overall experience there. Um, there are definitely some rumblings within Eclipse that the people from the Android team didn't go through and contact um, them or try to open any bugs against the Eclipse platform around this. Um, so, yeah, there, as soon as Android Studio was announced, uh, there was a, it got some people in the Eclipse community kind of riled up a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We've got a question from the chat room, actually. I always like to get those questions in. I know Randall does as well, which is around VMware. I mean, you said you were running the emulator, and I think it's the uh, the emulator that comes with the SDK or the – or the you said the uh, Intel version. Um, and he's running about VMware. Does does Can you can you do this on VMware? Can you um, emulate Android through VMware? Um, I don't think so. I don't, don't think so. I know that they uh, support um – no, you can't. You go through. It doesn't use VirtualBox. It uses uh, what's the other one? There's a QEMU. Yeah, yeah, Q. Yeah, it uses that to go through and um, run the Android emulation and stuff. So that's what the images and that's what the, the Android SDK um, goes through and supports. So yeah, um, yeah, I, I know that. I don't know if yeah, I've I've tried running it because I I would love to do it through VirtualBox um, as well, but I haven't really found anything. I I, I run a. Um, uh, I did find there is an Intel uh, version that you can run in uh, VirtualBox. I've got it set up on my machine uh, that runs a tablet uh, uh, form. You just have to download the x86 compatible kernel um, to run it off of. And it, it runs okay, but it's not the same as running the emulator that comes with the SDK. So uh, good. Um, so what else? I know that on your page you, you recommend a few apps. I'm glad that you recommend MX Player because that's my favorite media player on Android. There's a couple other ones here, though, that I didn't recognize. One is the Avia Media Player and the, the Vimu Player for Google TV. Why, why, what are those? Why would you need those? Well, they, for, on Google TV, one of the things that there's been a, several um, apps that have been for video playback that have been developed um, for a long time by Moo. Um, goes through and used to be known as GTV Box. Um, it goes through and has a very extensive support for playing subtitles, um, being able to uh, skip um, chapters and stuff. If you have an MKV and you've got um, chapters to find in your MKV file, um, it, it goes through and supplies um, support for that. Um, it, just ha it just has a lot more polished um, media player um, that that – and features and functionalities that people seem to to, to like, so it's a, you can go through and use those as external media players on the Google TV device. Avia Player um, is also another one that um, has the extensive support for subtitles and other advanced functionality that I don't have built into the um, into the app. Um, subtitles are built into Serenity, so you can do SRTs, but um, Vimu will go through if you got them embedded in the MKV. Um, they will go through. It goes through and supports the ability to go through and um, um, read those subtitles from the MKV directly. That's one thing that Serenity does not go through uh, and support. And I probably won't go through. Be going through and adding support for that because you have to go through and read the MKV um, directly yourself to figure out where the subtitles are um, within the MKV um, container format. So we should. So we should. Let's let's blow that up a little bit to make sure everyone's following yeah. us. So the MKV that's a file format and it has the ability to have embedded 
subtitle information in the in in that uh, you, you know within the file itself. So it's not an external right. uh, subtitle file, right? So what you're Correct. saying is that you, you if if I play an MKV and it has embedded subtitles in it, uh, I, I won't be able to see the subtitles. But if I download my own subtitles um, to my to the client, I'm guessing at that point, then I, and then yeah, I can sync up the subtitles with the movie. Or actually, you you, don't, you have an option with Plex to download the um, the subtitles um, from OpenSubtitles.org. There's a plugin actually that can actually automatically go through and fetch them, and it store them on the server. And if the um, server the metadata contains says, "Hey, I have subtitles here," um, the internal player can go through and support SRT um, formatted subtitles. Um, if you got them in embedded in the MKV um, itself. As you said, M MKV is a container, so it goes through, supports the video, the audio, um, chapters, and it can go through and support um, SRT embedded subtitles in the container itself. If you have those embedded in there, then you have to use, with, at least with Serenity, you have to go through and use an external player like um, by mood to go through and play those subtitles. Um, Plex, if you're using the official Plex client, then it will go through and do transcoding and to go through and uh, extract those subtitles out and embed them in the video image that it, that it sends back to the device. Got it. Got it. So that's actually a great way. So from your um, from from the client standpoint, if they're doing this on Google TV or on their Nexus Seven using Serenity, um, is that is that just an option that you pick? Basically, turn on subtitles, and then the Plex Media Server will go out and fetch those automatically and, and start showing them on the device. Well, it, the um, Plex Media Server should uh, has a plugin automatically. So as soon as you add, you can go through enable to open subtitles, and then as soon as you add a movie out to it. It'll go through and um, fetch down any subtitles um, at that time once once it's doing its initial scans. Um, after that, the subtitles are stored on the um, on the server itself. And then when I go through and access a movie um, detailed description for a movie, it will return back whether it has um, some subtitles or not um, for that for, the, for that particular movie. If it's an option, then I give an option up above the at least on the detailed version screen of the of the movie an option from a drop down list to go through and select a subtitle and then if it has it um it will go through and um, um play it back in the internal player or if you selected the external player and you've both selected the drop down list it'll go through and send those off to um like mx player um to go through and, and support it because mx player can go through and read external subtitle um urls as well so Oh, great! So you're passing that link back to that that file, basically, to MX Correct. Player, so that it, it'll just automatically play that subtitle. Correct. And the nice thing about X, MX Player is that it also um, went through and provided a um, API or an intent API um, setting in there to go through and resume from a certain vi video playback from a certain position. So you can go through. Plex keeps track of um, where your last playback position was, and as part of the metadata information you get back for a video and movie um, from, from Plex itself. So you can take, I take that information also if you selected X, MX player and I pass that information off to MX player as well. Um, so you can pick up and resume where you want. And M MX player is one of the few applications I know that will also return back to your application um, the um, last playback position that it had. So you can then go through and update the um, playback position on the Plex Media server as well. Nice, nice. Yeah, I hate to make this too much about MX Player, but it is a great app. I mean, I, I really love it. Yeah. Uh, for 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 a media player on Android, um, and subtitles are so great too. The reason I'm the reason I'm asking all these questions about subtitles is because they're so great for learning languages. Um, if you are if you're learning Spanish or if you're learning, in my case, you know, uh, a while back I was le learning Chinese. It was really great to be able to. Uh, see the the Chinese or the Spanish in the subtitles and hear the English, so that I could make that connection in my brain um, between between the two. So, and also we have a lot of international guests that stay with us, um, and it's great to be able to turn on whatever their local language is in case they're not really good English learners or English speakers yet. Um, it's really great to be able to turn on subtitles for for guests as well that may not be as good as English at English as as you yeah. are. So that's great. Really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to ask about a little bit more about Android, um, since we don't get very many Android developers on the show. Um, I know you've only been doing this for about seven months, but have you found that um, 
you know, even for example, Google t between Google TV and Nexus Seven, um, the, the there's a lot of differences there, and a lot of people talk about Android fragmentation. Have you run into that much as you've been developing this uh, this particular application? Have you run into the fragmentation issue? No, actually, I have, that's surprisingly that I haven't really run into um, fragmentation issue around that. I've stuck mainly with the core um, Android three dot two um, APIs and I've um, it's, it's so far been sticking to those. I haven't gone through and gone to anything in, in specific to um, 4.1 or 4.2 or any, any API that we would, would require that. So I haven't haven't run into that much in the way of um, issues on there. The only one I've run into recently, there's a small bug that I found on the um, OUYA um, with Serenity, but I haven't had a chance to take a look at it. I guess pop that thing in yesterday just to see if it will go through and run on the device and um but other than that um the fit app's been out there in the play store for three or four months um i think i've got maybe eight crash reports um but it's running on a multitude of um android tablets and um the biggest um selection is the various google tv devices and so far i haven't really run into the big um problem of, of fragmentation that a lot of people have, um, complain about yeah. So, so the, uh, one more question too before we have to wrap up, which is about the Ouya. You mentioned that a couple of times. I've got one sitting in the the, the living room. I've I've, I've uh, was on the bought into the Kickstarter, and so I got that a little early, and I've been playing with it. It's interesting. Um, what's that like? Because it seems like if you were um, uh, it, it's just a little bit of a different ecosystem. So, so what's that like developing for Ouya and when can we expect to see something available to download from the Ouya itself? Yeah. Um, I guess, I guess, just got the Ouya myself the other day. It's, um, to me, it's a lot like a Google TV device, except that it can go through and play native NDK, um, games and it can't go but, but it doesn't have the wide range of codec support that say like a Sony Google TV device um, has. So you, it's uh, like um, the interface is a Google TV type interface. Um, you got you got a controller to go through and, and work with. You got to develop for the D-pad um, navigation. You may have a little touchpad um, stuff stuff like that. But you don't want and your uh, interface looking like an Android tablet um, interface that's running on on the on the OUYA. Um, so and you also the other thing about the OUYA is right now since it only has um, the basic um, codec support in there you do have to um, sideload um, some other external players on there to be able to go through and play so like XBMC I know is being developed for for OUYA and some people have gone through and sideloaded it on the device and since it has its own internal codex and stuff, it can play back all the all the media. Uh, with Serenity, um, if you sideload MX Player, um, it works fairly well on there, and you can go through and play back. There's still some bugs within MX Player running on the Ouya um, as well. So um, as for when you're gonna see Serenity, I'm hoping to get the Serenity out there in, in the some version of it, probably in the ad supported version or a limited time trial um, version of it out in the Play Store within the next couple months. Um, it, it actually won't take too much to go through and update it. The, just that the requirement of OUYA to go through and have a um, in-app purchase type functionality um, for the app or you, or you make it free um, is, it was, is the main hold up right now for getting it on, on the OUYA in, in their um, store. And uh, what, uh, what license is this under? Uh, it's under a very liberal MIT license, so if anybody feels like forking it and taking it and putting their own version of it out there in the Play Store, all, they can go through and do that. Well, that's a, that's a really uh, responsible position to take. So uh, how did you choose that? Uh, well, I, I like the MIT license. I don't like a lot of restrictions on it. I don't like uh, some of the viral stuff that can happen with uh, GPL. Um, in there, so um, I learned a lot from open source development over the years, and this is just my way of um, giving back to the community and saying, all you have to do is mention where you got this code from, and you can use it however you want to go through and use it. That's that's awesome. I, it's sort of similar to the Perl license, which I really appreciate too. The artistic yeah. too that uh, is now currently released under. Um, and and what's what's 
you mentioned just a moment ago a few things that are near term on the future. What's, what's your roadmap look like? Where do you want to take this eventually? And when, when do you think uh, you'll be done with it? That'll be interesting. Uh, when, when will it be well, done? Well, it is. Well, where I want to take it right now is I want to get the basic stuff for Plex and support, except for the channel support. Um, mainly because right now um, I'm not going through and um, supporting the. Um, transcoding options and there's some stuff in the plex pass that require a plex pass that i probably won't go through and support um just because it requires a there's no real api for a lot of that stuff yet and in right now i haven't had a big user uh, cry out for uh, some of the plex pass functionality um out there um music library support is, is planned and probably um support for podcasts and netcasts um, will be be added probably before the end of the year as well. So that sounds like fun, and of course people can help you with that. Uh, and just by how, how do people find out about where to go to find to get more information on this? Yeah, they well they can follow. There's a Google Plus page that for Serenity itself um, out there. The main code is out there on GitHub. So it's at GitHub.com/NineWorlds/Serenity-Android. And that's where the main project repository um, is at. There's a wiki out there with the information on how to go through and check out the code, build it. Um, so if anybody wants to go through and mess around with it, go ahead and fork it um, and send me back pull requests. And we'll go through and take a look at them and see if we can get them um, added into the, um, the main code line. Okay. And that just brought up something else. So what's, what's behind Nine Worlds? Nine Worlds was, I was watching um, Thor um, and the Asgardian, so it's Nine Worlds from the, uh, the old Asgardian, um, or Asgardian legends and stuff. Okay, I'm not familiar with that, and I'm probably now just embarrassing myself in front of all my geeky <laughs> friends, but uh, I'll, I'll just take your word for it. That'll work. Uh, yeah. and, and why did you choose the name Serenity for this? Uh, I was a big fan of um, the TV show Firefly. So that's kind of, it started off as a code name and then it just kind of stuck with it um, after that. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, let's see, what's my other question here? Oh, I just noticed in your history that you did some work on the XSLT editor. Uh, isn't XSLT just a Lisp wannabe? Uh, well, sort of, but it's a functional style, <laughs> style language and stuff, so... <laughs> I always thought it was funny because XSLT was this really, you had all the elegance, and by that I mean inelegance, of angle bracket syntax, and then trying to be a programming language on top of that. So, um, I don't know, I never really got into it. I, I, I kind of hated it every uh, time it, I had to work with it. It's, it's actually great. If you know, once you know XPath and you know XL, XSLT, you can do all sorts of stuff very, in a very short amount of code to, do, to manipulate XML files. Yeah, yeah, and, and XPath itself is a is a whole different story as well in terms of specifying the the nth yeah. child of the thing that was in the thingy. We, should, we could do a whole yeah. show on XML and X, XPath and XSLT, but I do not want to do that because I, I hated that stuff when I was working <laughs> on it. So I feel sorry for you there that way. Okay, I have a, a, a running out of time. So two final questions. My usual two final questions. If you listen to the show before you know which one they are, what is your favorite uh, scripting language? Uh, Rex. Rex. All right. Well, that's a new answer, actually. I don't think I've heard wow, that. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Have we done Rex before? I don't know. T Rex, maybe, but not Rex. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, um, and uh, your obviously your favorite editor is probably Eclipse. So, but is that actually the answer? Um. Yeah. For right now, it's the, the favorite IDE is um, Eclipse. Um, I don't actually have a, a. I'm kind of an eyeball. I don't have a big favorite editor. I'm not a big fan of Emacs. I'm not a fan of VI. Um, so right now, it's Mainly, um, my, mainly Eclipse is what I go through and use right now. Awesome. And is, uh, I also need to ask this. Is there anything that we didn't ask that you want to make sure our audience is aware of before we have to let you go? Um, not necessarily right now. It's just if you're interested in looking for um, something to work on for, for the summer or you need something to scratch an itch, you want to learn Android development, um, have a Plex media server or something, um, want to add netcast support or... Um, podcast support um take a look at the serenity and fork it and start messing around with it very cool very cool it's been interesting chatting with you i learned a lot about android on this show which is great thank you aaron for helping me eliminate that some of that and uh, and david thank you for coming on and talking about serenity i'm sure people will be checking it out now all right thanks guys all right, that was David Carver, the head honcho and apparently sole committer at this point to the serenity for android project well aaron what'd you think well, it's really interesting. I mean, I think that uh, 
um, I, I'm glad that there's an alternative out there, and there are several, but I'm glad that there's one that's open source and that is very uh, willing to work with developers and even gives out the developer version for free. I think that's a great way. It's a little different for for the open source projects as we generally talk about them. Usually we talk about a support model for, for making money or something like that and uh, some sort of a subscription model maybe. But this is actually a, 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 an open source application um, that, that he's charging for. And, and a lot of times that doesn't work with, with some applications, but it's interesting that in a mobile marketplace like the Google Play Store, it actually does work and you can actually charge and people are willing to pay for open source software, um, especially at a low cost like that when it's very convenient to, uh, to just download, click on it, download it and, and, and run it. You know, it took me all of, you know, 10 seconds to get this running on my, or get this installed on my uh, Nexus 7 and on my Google TV. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Um, uh, you, Plex, I don't use Plex personally because because um, the backend is closed source. So I, I use XBMC. I use other things um, to make that happen. That's a choice for me. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with writing an open source front end to a closed source back end, um, especially when it's something that you can make better, you know, that, that you're actually encouraging people. I mean, I'm glad he mentioned like podcast support. You know, that's something that probably won't get added to the Plex, the official Plex client the official server. front end, uh, oh, well, or, or, the, or to the server. I mean, it's probably just not something that they're interested in doing. So, yeah. you know, adding that to the to a front end uh, to a client, I think, is great. So, yeah, overall, I think this is really good. I think people, if they're running Plex uh, media server, then they should they should really check this out. Yeah, and I, I like you know you, you mentioned that we we don't often talk to people where they have uh, sources all open, but you charge in some sort of store device store setup. Store, 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 it's just store. That yeah. would be the word, just, just store. Okay, don't need to add something <laughs> after the word store. Um, <laughs> where you charge for something, but then you have the source for it available or a, a in this case, even a binary download uh, available from his website. Uh, the Maker a few weeks ago was similar to that, except you could only get it from the Mac App Store, uh, you know, and you pay 10 bucks for it there or whatever. Uh, and if you, but if you want to actually have it for free, you've got to compile it from source. And that means you need a whole Xcode environment and it takes a bit of work. But he's got, he went one step further here and he's, uh, apparently he's making binaries available for, for direct downloads. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's great. I mean, why not, right? Because they're development versions anyway. So yeah, if you want to go run the development version, fine, you know, go, go pick it up. And I think it's a great way for people to try it out. Um, you know, w without having to pay for it, and and without him having to implement a a uh, what's that called a um, a nanny thing or you know something where you can only use it for thirty days or we're oh, going to disable yeah. you know we're going to disable all these all these features that you really want to use, but you can look at the interface. Isn't it cool? You know, I mean, I hate that when that happens. So uh, yeah, so so kudos for him for for making that available. Cool. Well, I probably won't be developing for Android anytime soon. I, I hate Java, so that's probably not anything I'm going to like and want to do later. Um, it just, it, I'm, I don't know. I, I guess I'm spoiled by languages like Smalltalk and Perl and, and soon Dart as I start expanding myself in that direction. Uh, but yeah, it's a, but it sounds like this is both interesting in terms of being a nice demonstration open source project. Uh, so other people can pick up on things. But I really like the fact that he said he was looking at other open source projects to figure out how to, the API works and how to plug things in. That is uh, that is one of the powers of open source. You can learn things uh, by looking at the source code of things, you know, like back in the old days when it was all open source, when, uh, essentially, because we were all looking at everybody else's uh, source code. Um, anything else on that or... Well, I know, but just I agree 100 percent. We don't usually talk about that as being a benefit of open source. We usually talk about, oh, you can contribute and get started in a project without having to be hired at a company. But but actually, I mean, that's the way people learn. That's the way I learned Perl, right, is I went out and saw how what other people were doing and uh, uh, how do I make this work? And I, uh, you know, I would download Perl scripts that someone did to, to, to do something. Oh, here's a calendar made out of Perl. Oh, how did he do this particular thing? Right. Uh, or she, he or she, I should say. Um so, so yeah, so I think that that's the best way to learn, and, and uh, with closed source, there's, there's just no way to do it. Absolutely. So, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and start wrapping up the show, doing my usual end speech stuff here, which is including talking about upcoming guests. Uh, we have uh, coming up in a few weeks, it's not going to be next week because I'm going to be on a cruise ship, I'll mention that in a couple, couple more minutes, what that's about, but we're going to do Ansible Works. This is a deployment software, sort of similar to Puppet or Chef or CF Engine, that sort of thing. Um, well, we're also going to bring on Possibly live from OSCON, 
but if there's live news at OSCON that trumps it, we're going to bring them on in a couple weeks later. The Kaltura video production environment. So that includes the video editing, streaming, production, that sort of stuff. I'm looking forward to that because we've actually had them on my long list for years. And finally, we've got them on the short list. Um, OpsView coming up after that. I think I just added this to the schedule. It's an enterprise server monitor. So similar to... Um, Oh, what are some of the other ones that are monitoring things? Uh, Monit and those guys. Not Monit. Uh, not Monit. But things that alert you when things go bad. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, what are the ones I'm running? I'm running uh, Zabbix and uh, Nagios, that sort of thing. So it's in that category of stuff. OpsView is being used by a number of people that way. And also just added to the schedule, Clockwork. I don't know much about this. Uh, picking a quote from the front page, says language and tools for process control. That sounds fascinating, so we'll have to look forward to those. Still trying to fill in some more of Q3, although Q3 is almost completely full now. You can go to twit.tv slash floss to see our current spreadsheet, and that also includes uh, all the uh, upcoming schedules and also the uh, people we're also talking to to fill those schedules with the, uh, when we can. You can follow us on Floss Weekly on Google+. Plus. I announce all the upcoming guests that way. Uh, you can also go to Floss Weekly on Twitter or no longer Identica. What's it called now? Pipe.io? PlugPure.io? Yeah, it's, it's plug something. Pipe something. Yeah. Plug Pipe. Yeah. Some four, some four letter P word. That's all I know. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I can't get my account live yet. I was promised a couple weeks ago that it'd be live, but uh, apparently it's not live yet. Um, you can also, uh, we also have a chat room. We took a couple questions in the chat room today. Cloud Operator, thank you for the questions that you've been asking in the chat room. We are at uh, live.twit.tv. We're typically at 8.30 a.m. Pacific times on Wednesdays. So um, if you look at the schedule, you can also find out what the show will be about and hang out with us and chat with us. And that's uh, that's Pacific time, right? I mentioned that already. You can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. But more often, I'm just speaking on Google Plus these days. Randall L. Schwartz on Google Plus. I'm talking a lot about uh, open source technology, but also about uh, things like related to my health and the things I've been doing about getting my weight loss and also all the other things about how conventional wisdom is really pretty screwed up. Um, I am taking, we're taking a break for the show for a couple of weeks. Uh, I am going to be on a cruise in Europe. I'll be heading out of the UK, heading to Norway. So if you're at any sort of port in Norway, I will probably be in your city coming up soon. Please follow my Google Plus and Twitter followings to figure out where I'm going to be and when. Uh, if you're in the UK, we do have a meetup coming up on the 17th of July, I believe it is, uh, at in a downtown London pub. Um, please uh, come over there and join us. It'll be like a little uh, Floss Weekly meetup. Um, and then I'm going to be back at OSCON the following week. So I'll be live from OSCON. We'll do a live show. I think Simon Phipps is going to be there. So we're going to do like a show with me and Simon. And we're going to try to find whatever the news is happening that week. But if not, we'll fall back to also doing the Kaltura show, which will be great because they're there as well, having a big announcement apparently. So that's going to be pretty fun. Um, that's everything I'm plugging. Uh, Aaron, what are you plugging today? Uh, when is OSCON? Is, it's uh, still up in Portland, right? Yeah, it's actually, yes, yeah, so I'm actually going to be home for a few days, which is really nice, or whatever I call home anyway, which is the uh, the spare bedroom of my friend. <laughs> um, maybe, I should maybe I should drive up there. I mean, Portland's not that far, right, from San Francisco? Oh, God. Uh, well, I drove that. I drove, <laughs> I, drove, I drove from Portland, L.A., and it took two days, and I don't ever want to do that again. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, a long, it's a long run. Yeah, I used to drive back and forth, though. I used to work in, uh, for Tandem Computers uh, for about a, uh, two or three years, and so I would drive back and forth like every couple of weeks, and, oh, I, that's when I was much younger. Let me put it that way. I was much younger and much crazier and much stupider. Even with podcasts to listen to the entire way this time, I was bored by about the fourth hour. So and given that it's 12 hours from Portland to L.A., yeah. it was really, really annoying. Um, John, yeah. says, John says it's 11 hours from, from uh Only you know, if you do the speed limit. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Only if you do the anyway, speed limit. Anyway, okay, back to plugging, yeah. plugging, right. plugging. <laughs> okay, Google, Google Plus. Follow me on Google Plus. Add me to your circles. It's the best place to... Uh, uh, talk to me and interact with me because I'm. That's where I do. That's where I, I'm looking at, right? So I publish my stuff out to Facebook and Twitter. If you want to follow me there, that's fine. But if you want to actually talk to me and interact with me, I've had a lot of great discussions, by the way, on Google Plus lately with uh, folks that follow uh, or that watch Floss Weekly. So that's really great. Also, um, uh, if you are a if you watch uh, All About Android, I'll be on All About Android in a few weeks, um, and also on Twig on an upcoming episode. I haven't got that nailed down yet, but uh, I show up on those shows also as well as Floss Weekly, so watch for me there as well. If you're interested in making things with Raspberry Pi or or things like that, you should go to uh, MakeZine. 
dot uh, com and look at the projects page. I've talked about the Raspberry Pi old time radio project I was doing, and that's published now um, on the uh, the Make website. So if you go to the projects or just look in in Google Plus, look under me, and you'll see the post that I did this week about that. So that's published there as well. You can make your own. Uh, take an old uh, radio. Um, uh, you know, from the 40s or 50s or whatever, put a Raspberry Pi in there and bring it back to life and actually stream old time radio through that device again. So it's it's pretty cool as well. And I'm also, I hate to bring this up because I know we've been railing on Java a little bit, but I'm taking the uh, uh, intro to programming course from uh, Udacity, which has been very interesting since I already have a little bit of programming background. Um, but this one is based all around Java. And so I know you said you hate Java, Randall, but uh, I'm learning all about that. And it's been really interesting coming from uh, mostly a Perl background to see what it's like. Oh, where's CPAN? You just can't just download this module. Like, what's going on? But uh, but but it's been very interesting. It's a really great learning experience. That's what I love to do is learn about new things. And so uh, I'm working on that as well. Anyway, very interesting stuff. Well, if you don't mind uh, stabbing yourself with a sharp stick over and over again, then you probably won't mind Java. <laughs> I guess uh, that's that's how I feel about it. It's just every time I have to. Every time the answer is Java, I know I asked the wrong question, so that's yeah, how that goes. It is, it's, it's, very, it's different. If you're coming from a different background, it's very yeah. different. If you were to learn Java first and start with that, then, you, then that would be your frame of reference. Then you know, going back the other way would be difficult, but it's, it's not bad. Yeah. Oh, what do you mean? In Perl, you can just put a variable in there? No, that's yeah, too easy. Exactly. No, <laughs> it's too easy. Yeah. You just declare a hash with curly braces and it's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all it is. Right. Yep. <laughs> so there we go. Yep. Um, so, again, as I said, we're going to be back uh, in three weeks on July 17th for our next show, which will be Ansible Works. So I'm looking forward to being, uh, again, a host of that show. I don't know who's the co-host is yet. We'll have to work it out. But we'll have that back. And so we'll see you again. I'll see you again all all see all of all of you again all, we'll all, we'll see you again next time <laughs> oh god on floss weekly <laughs>